Amen. Amen. I know you guys just sat, and I'll let you sit for a little bit. In fact, I'll go through a couple of announcements before I have a stand for the reading of God's word. Um, If you don't have an outline and you want to follow along with where we're going, go ahead and lift your hand, and uh, Ben will make sure that you get one. We've got uh, some people up here that need an outline. Um, And also, I'm going to put this in my back pocket. Uh, On the back table, uh, when you leave, there are these cards that are really simple. It just says, come to church. So come to church, and I want everybody here, and I'll remind you at the end, uh, to grab a stack of five of these, uh, of five. And your goal, your challenge is to just hand out two of them to two different people this week. Uh, and on the back of it, it just says you're invited officially uh, to church. But if God puts someone on your heart, or if you are in the midst of a conversation and you want to invite someone to church, well, here you go. You have a tool. It's a little business card size invitation, and you can invite them to come to church. Also on the back table, you're going to see a thing that says get plugged in. Uh, get plugged in. What God has called us to in the church is impossible to do if all we do is show up and dip out. And that's why we have so many different things at Ecclesia uh, to get actually plugged into the body. We have home groups that are meeting every Thursday, uh, two different home groups. They meet every other week. Uh, this week's home group is going to be in our house um, Thursday at 630. Uh, and then every other week is at the Carlier's house. Uh, we have uh, space for kids. You guys can come get plugged in at home group. Uh, women's group is going to be the third Friday every third Friday of the month at 6 p.m., which means they just had their women's group this last Friday. And I, uh, it's very awkward when I'm at the house still and I'm like in the back room. I got to pretend like I'm not there, but I got to leave. And so I got to like just go into the middle of the conversation. Uh, but what I saw on my quick exit out the house was that it was a great turnout. And uh, Candace uh, was just letting me know it was a great time of fellowship uh, for the ladies getting together. Uh, for the men's group, we do that on the, f- uh, the first Friday of the month. And so um, that's going to be coming up here the first Friday of the month at 7 o'clock. Uh, we do it very similarly in the sense that we usually have some food and fellowship and we have a, a discussion around a scriptural topic. Um, and so at the men's group, we're talking about biblical manhood and we're also doing it over barbecues. So we're calling it barbecue and Bibles and you are invited uh, to my house on the first Friday of the month, seven o'clock. We'll have barbecue and Bibles. And then the, the last thing to get plugged in is prayer and worship. Um, and this should really be the first thing, but it's the last thing on the list. So it's in no particular order, but prayer and worship. Uh, Jesus says that my house will be a house of prayer. And if there's anything that you can uh, discern from just looking at the world, looking at the media, is that we need prayer. The church needs to come back to the basics of prayer. This, this country is not going to be won back over by politicians and by policy. It's going to be the people of God calling out to the Lord on their knees. If people would humble themselves and call out to him and pray, then he would heal our land. And so uh, we do that the last Tuesday of the month. So not this coming Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. It's just a night of prayer and worship. That's it. No other agenda. We just worship with songs, with music. There's going to be uh, worship music and then a, a time of prayer. And so I want to invite you to do that the last Tuesday every month at 630 at 630. Uh, and then the last announcement is, um, is just to give, uh, to be a giver. If you call this your church home, uh, get in the regular practice of being a giver. Our goal as a church is to be uh, self-sustaining by the end of our third year. At the end of our third year, uh, we have a little bit of time. If it happens before then, praise the Lord. The end of our third year is going to be next October. So we got some time. This coming October is our, our two-year anniversary. And so we're going to have a, a, a good time at that. But our goal is to, to be self-sustaining by the end of our third year. Uh, and what does self-sustaining mean? That means able to do our core ministry without the support of outside help. Right? That should be the goal of every church, right? to be self-sustaining. And that only happens through the faithful giving of the people that call this their home. Um, and, and so we invite everybody to not give out of compulsion or obligation, uh, but out of a cheerful heart because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And there's th- several different ways to give. You could give on the back table. You could give in the lobby. You could give online. Um, and there you go. So those are our announcements. Um, Okay, if you have your Bibles, and hopefully you do, because this is what we do here at Ecclesia, is we are trying to develop biblically literate, gospel-fluent, Christ-centered, mission-minded disciples. And the way we do that is by orienting ourselves around the Word of God, not my opinions. This is not a weekly TED Talk from Pastor Sean, and here's what I'm thinking about. No, we dig into the text, and we want to understand what God has spoken for the church. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 17. We're continuing in our study in John. And uh, for, the, for the last four weeks and the next several weeks, we will be unpacking the Lord's Prayer. This is not the typical Lord's Prayer that we all know that we repeat 
Uh, but this is the, the actual prayer of Jesus the night before he's betrayed. This is what we call the high priestly prayer. This is Jesus spending an entire chapter praying to the Father. It's the longest prayer we have in the Bible recorded of Jesus. And in this series, we uh, are asking the question, what does it look like to pray like Jesus? We want to pray more like Jesus. I want to pray more like Jesus. I pray that your prayer life is deepened and enriched through this series. And so as we're continuing, it's in John chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 9 and uh, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. The reason why we stand for the reading of God's word, this is a, a practice that my pastor taught me that is just a sign of reverence and respect, that we're not just passively looking at the word of God, that we are standing in awe, standing in respect for the reading of his word. Everything after this is my dissertation and my sermon on this word, but this is the word of God. John 17, starting in verse 9, Jesus says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, because they're yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine, and I am glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you've given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except for the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you, and I'm speaking these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. I've given them your word. The world hated them because they're not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you've given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So in this series uh, called Pray Like Jesus, we're looking at the Lord's final prayer before he gets sent to the cross. And in the first night, uh, we, part one, we just had introduction, introduction to this prayer. We looked at the characteristics of Jesus's prayer. So like if you were to describe Jesus's prayer with adjectives, how was his prayer to the Father? And we looked at his prayer was deeply theological. Like your theology influences the way you're going to pray. Uh, what you understand about God, what you believe about the Bible influences the way you pray. And sometimes your theology is whack, so your prayer life is whack. So to get a better your prayer life, you got to grow in your knowledge of the Word of God. So his prayer was deeply theological. Second, it was deeply intimate. This is not just a, a, a religious rite. This is not just an incantation. This is not a magic spell. This is Jesus talking to his dad. He's talking to his father. And that's how we ought to pray is deeply intimate and also is deeply God-centered. It wasn't, Lord, protect me from this hour. I don't want to go to the cross. All these people are sinners anyway. He wasn't praying anything about his convenience. It was for other people, and it was for the glory of God ultimately. So that was part one. Part two, then we started digging into not just the characteristics of his prayer, not what his prayer was like, but what did he actually pray for? Right? And that's where we're going to spend the rest of this series is what did Jesus actually pray for? So the first thing that we looked at was intimacy. So the second night, the first aspect or the first uh, topic of his prayer was intimacy. He starts and ends his prayer that we may know the Father. In the same way that he knows the Father, that intimate relationship he has, he wants us to have that. So we prayed, uh, we looked at his prayer of intimacy. He doesn't want you to, to just have this a belief in him. God doesn't want you to just have this intellectual understanding of him. He wants you to know him. Faith goes beyond the mind into the heart. If your faith only stays up here, then it's not the type of faith that Jesus was praying that you would have. He wants it to go from your head to your heart. Part three, we looked at not only intimacy, but he also prayed, this was last week, he prayed for our protection. Pray for our protection. Uh, we saw how Jesus prayed for his disciples and then consequently us. He prayed uh, for our protection. And in looking at, at that, we looked at the reality that there is real danger. If he, he wouldn't be praying for our protection if we didn't need to be protected. There's real danger that we are surrounded by. 
there's dangers from without, from outside the church, and also dangers from within, inside your own flesh. Sometimes we're our own enemy, right? And so we have real dangers, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and he's praying for our protection. Ultimately, what does he want us to be protected from? From falling away, from making shipwreck of our faith. He wants us to be kept safely into the embrace of the Father. God uh, cares about and tends to our protection. That was good news, is that if the protection was all up to us, then we'd be in big trouble because we would be like, have you ever seen that uh, video on the internet? It's hilarious. It's like, this is how Jesus is with his sheep. And it's this, this shepherd pulling a sheep out of this like crevice that he falls inside of. And the sheep is like head first into this little crack and the this, this shepherd pulls him out and the sheep finally gets freed. And then he just runs and he d- dives right back into it. Like, that would be us if it was up to us. But, but God doesn't just care for our protection. He also tends to our protection, meaning that he is the one who started the work in you. He's going to see it through to completion, and that's good news. So what do we live like? We, we live with sober confidence, right? We, we're aware of the dangers that we're surrounded by, but we're also confident in the protection of our Lord. And that leads us to tonight, the fourth aspect, the fourth uh, piece of content of Jesus' prayer is sanctification, sanctification. And this is a somewhat of a a continuation of last week's message. Last week, I talked about protection and how it's going to kind of bleed into this week. And this is what tonight is, sanctification. Uh, The Lord is praying for our protection. But what are we protected from? We're protected from falling away, from making shipwreck of our faith, from discrediting our testimony and our witness. And, And I can tell you this, that there's only one safe place to be. And that place is to be walking in the will of the Lord, to be walking in the will of the Lord. Uh, Some people, by the way, they they believe that everything is the Lord's will. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a whole theological discussion, and maybe some here might disagree with me on this, but not everything that happens is God's will. Not everything that happens is God's will. Um, I'm going to give you some passages, and maybe they're on the screen. I I sent them kind of, this wasn't actually part of the notes. I just sent this to Ben last minute, so I don't know if we were able to add them. If not, it's okay. You can just note them. Matthew 23, 37. Listen to this. This is Jesus praying. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather you, to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. So what do we see there? Jesus longs for something, to gather Israel's children in the same way that a hen gathers her chicks. But guess what? They weren't willing. Jesus had a desire. They weren't willing. Did Jesus get what he wanted? No. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 through 4. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Are all people saved? Does Jesus get what he wants? Not in this case. He wants everybody to be saved, but we know that not everybody is. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Do some people perish? Yes, and they never come to repentance. Does God want that? No, he's not getting his way. In this Ezekiel 18, 23, it says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? declares the sovereign Lord, rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their way and live? Like he has a preference that they would turn from their way and live, not perish. For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord, repent and live. God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. He would rather that they do something else. What? Turn and repent. But they do what they want to do. They don't always turn and repent. Couple more, Isaiah 30, verse 1. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the word, to those who carry out plans that are not mine. You got plans, you could carry them out, even if they're not God's plans for you. So that means God has a plan for your life, but you have the ability to walk in that plan or not. He says, to those who carry out plans that aren't mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit. Heaping sin upon sin. God has plans, but the obstinate children, they had different plans. And he said, that ain't by my spirit. So you can't just take this passive look on, on your Christian life and be like, well, if the Lord wills, if the Lord's will, it'll happen. No, you actually have some stuff to do. You have a part to play in this. Luke seven thirty. but the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves. Did God have a purpose for the Pharisees for the law, uh, for the experts in the law, he had a purpose for them. He says, but they rejected God's purpose for them. That wasn't God's purpose for them to walk in what they were walking in. 
He had a different purpose, but they rejected God's purpose. God had a plan for them. Jeremiah 19 is the last one. They've built high places to, to Baal, to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal. Something I did not command or mention, nor did it even enter my mind. God desires and commands justice and protection for the innocent. But what happened here? People use their freedom to defy the command and the will of the Lord. He did not want that. He did not want them to sacrifice their kids in the fire, but they used their freedom to go against the will of the Lord for their life. So I'm sorry, not everything that happens is God's will. And that's not even the point of this message. That's not even the point of this message. This is a bold statement for a very small aspect of this message. Why am I making it? Because it's important for you to not take a passive approach to your walk with God. You cannot take a passive approach to your walk with God as if whatever God's will is for your life is just going to happen. So I might as well just live my life, have my faith, hope for the best. No, God has a purpose for you and you can choose to walk in it or not. And if you don't walk in the purpose of the Lord for your life, you are not safe. You are working actively against God's prayer for you. His prayer was for your protection, but there's only one safe place and that's in the will of the Lord. So if you're walking outside of the will of the Lord, there's no safety. If you're walking outside of the will of the Lord for your life, you're actively fighting against Jesus' prayer in John 17 for your life. And that's dangerous. The scary part is you can be walking outside of the will of the Lord for your life and feel really good in that place. You can feel really good. In fact, you can even look righteous and religious in that place. In that place of drifting in that place of growing cold in your heart and your devotion to the Lord and his plan for your life. Life's going well. You have enough money to pay your bills. Your job's going great. Your, ma- your marriage, your relationships, your family's doing well. You have just enough morality in your life to appease your conscience to not be convicted that you're walking outside of the will of the Lord. I have just enough morality in my life to where I'm not living in sin. I'm good. Are you walking in the will of the Lord for your life? There's only one safe place and that's in the will of the Lord. The enemy might not be messing with you. Why? Because you're not a threat. He's not afflicting you. Why? Because he knows that if he afflicts you, it'll take you to your knees to ask questions to God. Like, why? And God's a great question. Right now you're on your knees. It's not saying that that's what has to happen. But hey, if I am drifting, Lord, kill me before my convictions die. If I start drifting away from my devotion and my love for you, I pray that Lord would use anything to bring me back to him because there's only one safe place and that's in the will of the Lord. The enemy might not be afflicting you again because you're not a threat to his kingdom, to the kingdom of darkness. You might be blissfully ignorant of the reality that you're far from God, that you're outside of his will for your life. So so as Christ is praying for our protection, he's also revealing the will of the Lord for our life, that we would be safe, we would be protected, that we would remain in him, that we wouldn't fall away, that we would not make shipwreck of our faith. That's God's will for your life. But here's the thing. He calls you to be an active participant in answering that prayer for your life. He's telling you, he, this is my will for your life. I'm praying this to the Father, but you are invited to participate in answering this prayer. That's a, that's a trip to me, to think that God is praying for me. Jesus, in this moment, God the Son is praying for me, and then in giving me his prayer, recording it in the word of God, is actively inviting me to participate in answering this prayer for my life. So how, how do we answer this prayer of protection? By first surrendering to the process of sanctification. Surrendering to the process of sanctification. And this is in your outline. If you have your outline, the first point is participate in your protection by surrendering to your sanctification. You like that? The P's and the S's? Yeah. Participate in your protection by surrendering to your sanctification. If I was a rapper, I'm not, I'm not going to even try. But Bobby, you know, yeah, that was, that could have been good. That could have been, no? All right. Participate in your protection. So he's praying for our protection. We get to participate. How? By surrendering to your sanctification. Looking back at our key text, look at John, uh, starting in verse 17, John 17, 17. There's three times he uses this $5 theology word called sanctify. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me to the world, I also sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Some of your versions might say consecrate, consecrate them by the truth. Uh, the, the, the word is hagiazo. I'm not a Greek scholar, but that's just what the Greek word is, hagiazo, uh, to sanctify, to set apart, to make holy. 
Uh, this can mean an active dedication, <clears throat> an active dedication in service to God. Like I'm sanctified, like he's sanctified. Um, it's an active dedication to serve uh, and service to God or the act of regarding or honoring as holy. What's interesting is the word um, for sanctify, hagiazo, if you look at the word saint, and hopefully it's up there, yeah, the, the Greek word saint is hagios. So sanctify and saint, right? We are called saints, right? When Paul writes to the churches in Corinth, he writes to the saints in the church in Corinth, right? To the saint, that we are all saints. What is saint? It's the same word. It was, uh, it's derived from the same word. It means consecrated ones. You as a saint are a devoted one to the Lord. You are the Lord's holy people. You are the sanctified ones. So when Jesus is talking to us and when Paul is writing to the saints, that includes all of us. We are the consecrated ones. To be sanctified just means to be set apart. To be set apart. So here's the thing. When you set something apart, let's say I get this, this uh, uh, communion juice and I set it apart. I'm setting it apart from something. I'm removing it from the table, but I'm also setting it apart for a reason, to do something. So I'm setting it apart from something to something or for something. So we need to be asking two questions. What are you as a sanctified one, as a set apart one? That's who we are. We are sanctified. We are being set apart. What are we set apart from? And what are we set apart for? What's the reason for which we are set apart? We are set apart from the world. We're set apart from what is sinful, of course, what's common. In a word, we're set apart from the world. He says in verse 14, I've given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of this world. They are not of this world. Just as I am not of this world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, which is interesting. So he sets us apart from the world, but he doesn't say that we're taken out of the world. He says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. So in the same way, right, because in, in Christianity, we can have a separatist view in the sense that we, I'm sanctified, I'm separate, so we completely remove ourselves and detach ourselves from the world. And we start a Christian commune, and we all hold hands and sing kumbaya, and right? No, he doesn't call them out of the world, but he does set them apart from the world. So we are set apart from the world, but, but what are we set apart for? He says in verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. That's, it. That's crazy. He's saying, set them apart. They're not of this world, but I'm sending them into it. I sanctify myself for them so that they may be sanctified by the truth. So for what purpose? Point two, we are sanctified from the world and sent into the world. We're sanctified from the world and sent into the world. So, so we have been separated from the world to continue the ministry of Jesus to the world. He says, in the same way that I sanctify myself and I was sent into the world, I'm sending them in that same way. So what does that mean? That means you don't adopt the mindset of the world. That doesn't mean that you separate completely. It doesn't mean that you don't have a job, that you don't go to the common places. It doesn't mean that you don't have friends and relationships that are in the world. No, he says that in that case, you'd be taken out, but he doesn't pray that we'd be taken out. So we don't adopt the mindset of the values. We don't hold to the values uh, of this world. We don't look to the world for your sense of worth. You don't look to the world for your sense of belonging. You don't look to the world for your sense of peace. You don't look to the world for your sense of satisfaction. You don't look to the world for your joy. You don't look to the world for your contentment. You are set apart. You look to Christ for all of that because the world will get you, let you down every single time. You will not be accepted. You will not be valued. You will not be loved. You will not be cared for. You will not be satisfied. You will not have peace. You will not have joy. You will not have contentment in any of those things, but in the Lord. So that is set apart from the world, but why? so that you could be effective in your ministry to the world. The world is not like, hey, you need to just be careful, like just hide from the world, like the boogeyman. Hide yourself in a closet until I come. Don't worry, I'm coming. That's not what it is. He, he loves these people. These are the people that he died for. And he calls us to be vessels of saving them in the same way that he was sent out. You can't be effective in your ministry to the world if you are of the world. If you have the same values, the mindset, they need to be freed from that. They need to be unplugged from the matrix, so to speak. You can't serve them if you are just like them. You can't serve the world if you're just like the world. So you are supposed to look different. 
for the purpose of reaching them and loving them. Jesus set the pattern for us to follow. What did he do? What did Jesus do? He, he shined his light in the darkness. That's what he did. He shined his light. He, he revealed the Father to the lost, to the hurting, to the broken. He set captives free. We're supposed to go out to the world, love them, set them free, bring healing, bring restoration, bring good news, the gospel of good news to them, bring salvation to the oppressed, bring healing to the sick and to the broken, to proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus did. And he tells us to do the same thing. We've been set apart and we've been sent in two. That's the purpose of your sanctification, that you would be sanctified, set apart, consecrated, that you'd be completely different than the world so that you could be effective in your ministry and service to them. Now, the question is, how does that happen? How does this sanctification happen? Uh, Point three, there's two aspects of your sanctification, of you being set apart, of you being consecrated, being made more like Christ, being made holy. There's two aspects. It's positional sanctification and progressive sanctification. So the first one is positional. Positional sanctification, this is the the, the position that you hold of being in Christ. You are positionally already sanctified. Hebrews 10.10 says, by this, by this will, we have been sanctified. So guess what? If you are a believer, if you have put your faith in Christ, you are sanctified. This is a past tense event from the moment of your faith in Christ. You have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all time. 2 Corinthians 6, 11. And some of you used to also be like this in the world, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So so the moment you come into faith and the moment you come into a relationship with God, you are positionally sanctified. So that means when you stand before the Father, he doesn't see you for all your mess. He doesn't see you for all your sin. He doesn't see you for all the, the shame and the disgrace. He only sees the righteousness of Christ clothing you. That is positional sanctification. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our sins. You were saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. This is all past tense. It's all past tense. This happened at the moment of you believing that you are in Christ. You are hidden in him. You are sanctified. You are raised up with him, seated with him right now in heavenly places. That's good news. Because I don't feel sanctified all the time. And not all of you feel sanctified all the time. And in fact, you guys are probably doing some stuff that doesn't seem sanctified, right? You might have, even this morning, been doing an unsanctified act, but that does not take away your position of sanctification because you are made holy, not because of your own works, but because of his mercy, his grace, the covering of Jesus over you. He only sees Christ's righteousness because of faith, not by anything that you've done. Positionally, we are sanctified. That's good news. That's good news for us. But there's also the second aspect of progressive sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 3, he says, For this is God's will, your sanctification. This is an active ongoing, by the way, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and in honor. That's God's will, your sanctification, continually, progressively. You have been sanctified, but you are being sanctified. You are continually being sanctified, being set apart. Philippians 1, 6, I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work will carry it on to completion into the day of Christ. So he starts a good work on the day of your salvation, and he will see it through to completion, not until you're perfect here in this life. He says, until the day of the Lord. Basically, this is going to happen the rest of your life. This process of continually being sanctified. And guess what? The, the, so when you think you have arrived, something might happen to where you realize quickly that you have not. It's a scary place to be if you think you have arrived. And that was the, the Pharisees. That was the religious people, the, the uh, Sadducees and the, the scribes. They thought they had arrived. They've been, you know, sanctified and we're good. We're perfect. It's like, this is a scary place to be. If you realize, if you think that you have arrived, he says, no, he's going to actually carry this on into completion until the day of Christ. Second Corinthians 3, 18, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, and we are being transformed. We, 
will be, of course. We have been transformed, but he says we are being transformed. Into what? Into the same image from glory to glory. This is the will of the Lord who is the Spirit. This is God's purpose for your life, your sanctification, that you would be more and more into the image of Christ, that you would look more like Jesus, that you would be set apart. And this positionally, from the moment you are saved, you're saved. That's good. You don't have to earn it. Faith saved you. Faith will keep you. Okay. But as you are in faith, you now realize that there's this painfully slow process of sanctification in your own personal life. This is called progressive sanctification. You have been made holy, and you are being made holy. Now, when when reading the scriptures, a lot of times for me, I'm I'm like a practical type of person. I want to look at, like, what's the application? What do I need to do? And not all scripture is like that. Sometimes you just need to believe, right? Sometimes you just read it, and the, the call to action is just believe what it says. But there are some practical messages, and tonight's message uh, is going to be very practical, right? So last week was really setting the foundation of the reality that we're in. As Jesus is praying for our protection, uh, it, we, the reality is we're in danger, but Jesus cares for and tends to our protection. Uh, and so in light of that, we're to live with sober confidence. Tonight, I want us to explore what God has in mind for us to participate in and partner in with Jesus in, his, uh, in his, uh, the answer to this prayer for us. And that is, again, surrendering to the process of progressive sanctification. You have nothing to do with your personal, uh, the positional sanctification that's been taken care of at the cross. But the progressive sanctification, you actually get to participate in. In fact, you have to participate in or else it's going to be a lot longer and slower. He will, he will perfect you through the fire, through all kinds of trial, but it doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be that hard. You don't have to learn every lesson the hard way. I mean, some lessons you're going to learn the hard way, but you don't got to learn every lesson the hard way. Like you can shorten your learning curve a little bit, right? So let's talk about shortening your learning curve about progressive sanctification. Now, here's the reality. Because you have been sanctified, this means that in Christ, all of your life is a process of continual sanctification. And God will use whatever he needs to in your life to purify you. If you are married, you know this very well. He will use your spouse to purify you. He will use your kids, if you are a parent, to purify you. He will use your job. He will use your circumstances. He will use the good and the bad to purify you. So if you're going through a trial, this is why James 1 is one of my favorite passages. He says, you can count it a joy, my brothers, when you suffer trials. It makes no sense. Joy? Count it a joy when you suffer trials. Like doesn't make any sense, but he said, no, you can count it a joy when you suffer trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith builds perseverance and perseverance has to have its work so that your faith could be complete, not lacking anything. So it sucks going through a trial of many kinds. He says, but you can count it a joy. Why? Because God is sanctifying. He's working something out of you. He's building up your perseverance. He will use all kinds of things to sanctify you. I mean, uh, and I said this kind of tongue in cheek with your wife and your, your, or your husband, your spouse, but this is absolutely a fact that the Lord will use your closest relationships to purify, to get all of those ugly things that you didn't even know were in there, bring it to the surface. And now you got to deal with that. I didn't even know that was in there. I thought I was good. I thought I was sanctified. I thought the Lord had freed me from that. And all of a sudden you pulled this out of me. No, that was always in you. God pulled it out of you, and he used this person that you love, who knows how to push the buttons the right way, to bring what was in your heart. Why? So you could deal with it. Let's deal with that. That's that progressive sanctification. He is accomplishing, and he will continue to accomplish it until the end. He says in Hebrews 12, 2, keep your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith, meaning the the one who started it and the one who completes it. Keep your eyes on him because as you're in your trial, as you're in these relational issues, as you're in your job issues, as you're in your financial issues, as you're in whatever issues, health issues, whatever it might be, you could count it a joy because God is going to bring all of those things outside of you that need to be dealt with. And how do you deal with them? He says, keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the one who started it. He'll continue to finish it. So he, he invites us to actively participate in this process of shortening your learning curve. Again, you don't have to learn everything the hard way. You're going to make mistakes, but you can also avoid a lot if you're intentional about partnering with Jesus' process of personal sanctification in your life. 
So when it comes to your sanctification, when it, be, when it comes to your purification, don't th- see yourself as just an active recipient. God, please just zap me with patience. God, please just zap me with purity. God, please just take this temptation away from me, this addiction that I've had, this pornography that I can't stop looking. Just take it away. Just zap me. And he's like, no, you got to be an active participant in this. I wish you would just zap us. But he doesn't do that. He calls you to be an active participant, not a passive recipient. He's given us three means. Three, that was weird. That was two. Three. Three means of participating in the process of sanctification. Like I said, he's going to use all kinds of things, but there's three things that you could prioritize in your own life to partner with what God is doing in your life. No, he is making you more like Christ. That is his will for your life. He will do it through completion, but you could surrender to the process and you, it'll save you a lot of heartache. It'll save you a lot of trials. You'll be able to leave here tonight and instantly apply this message to your life because point four, God has provided the means of your sanctification. God doesn't leave us to achieve sanctification on our own. He graciously provides us with tools that guide us and empower us on this journey. Those tools are the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the unity of the church. Now, he'll use all kinds of other things, but in this text, those are the three that we see. The Holy Spirit. John 17, 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be in me or so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be completely one, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them and as you have loved me. He's referring to the indwelling Holy Spirit. Remember, he's just spent four chapters in the upper room discourse. Uh, we just spent, I don't know, 20 weeks in that. Uh, we, in the upper room discourse, talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. So he's telling you, you're, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to minister to you. And now he's praying. And in his prayer for protection and sanctification, he's like, God, I've given them the glory. I've given them everything that you've given me. I am in them. That Christ in us is the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13, he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he's not going to speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what's to come. So here's the question. How much of your life is spirit led? How much of your life is spirit-led, or do you just kind of wake up and go with the flow, or do you have your own plan and your own reasoning and your own will for your life, or how often are you led by the Spirit? Are you consulting with the Holy Spirit? And this is where all the conservative Christians are like, ooh, what does that mean? Don't worry. Like, he gives us the Holy Spirit, and he says, you can be led by the Spirit. You should be led by the Spirit. Saves you a lot of heartache and trial if you're led by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk by the Spirit. And you won't gratify or carry out the desires of your flesh. Your flesh has desires. I wake up and my first thing, I want to check my phone and eat food. That's my flesh's desire. Your flesh has desires too. And we are carried along by our flesh more so than we probably think. And it's not always into sinful things to where we're like breaking God's law. But he says to lead by the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. If you walk by the Spirit, you're not going to gratify the desires of your flesh. So all those small inklings, those moments to where you're like, is that God? Just follow that. The more you hear that, the more frequent it it will become, the more obvious it will become. But here's the thing, the more you harden your heart towards that, to that small, still voice, to where the Holy Spirit, you know he's leading you and you do something else anyway, you've just hardened your heart. It becomes less frequent, less obvious to where you're completely carried out and living by your flesh. No discernment, no spiritual discernment. He's given you the Holy Spirit for a reason, to be led by the Spirit. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. If you're not led by the Spirit continually and you're just gratifying the desires of your flesh, then you have no voice of the Holy Spirit. You have no spiritual discernment. You are not protected. You are not safe. It doesn't mean that you're going to lose your salvation, but you might be in for a world of heartache and a world of trouble if you're not led by the Spirit. If you act, you actively participate in your sanctification by being led by the Spirit. Here, here's some of the things that, okay, so the, the question is like, how do you be led by the Spirit? Well, that's one of the things is the moment. Okay, I'll just give you this one. As I gave my life to the Lord in November 2007, and I said, Lord, I love my sin, but for the first time in my life, I hate my sin. And if you're real, you need to change my heart because I can't just stop loving the things that I've always loved. So God, change my heart, make me a new person, and I'll do whatever you want me. And then right when I said, whatever you want me to do, instantly 
quit your job at the bar. I, I didn't hear the audible voice of God. I did not have a vision. He didn't open up the heavens. I just felt in my mind that didn't come from my flesh. My flesh was like, no, no, keep working. It's fine. You'll be a light in the darkness. He doesn't care about all this. It's like, no, instantly quit your job at the bar. And I was like, I know that's the Holy Spirit. And if I did not follow that, I don't know what would have happened, but I could probably guess that I would repeat cycles that I've been repeating perpetual cycles of sin and destruction. And it would have been a spiritual high in a moment. I walked to the altar, prayed a prayer, but I didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. But instantly I felt it. And I was like, I cannot. If I don't listen to the Holy Spirit, I don't know where I'm going to be. And I've tried on my own. I've, I've followed my own flesh. I followed my own desires and it has not gotten me anywhere where I want to be. And I don't want to go to hell. If I were to stand before the Lord in all of my sin at that moment, I knew that he would be just in sending me to hell. I knew it because I wasn't living for him. I didn't care what God wanted for my life. I was living for myself. And I knew that if I was standing before pure holiness, pure light, that I would be consumed. But I also saw that he put my punishment upon his son and he laid it all, all the judgment, all the wrath that was due to me, he laid it upon his son. And he's like, I'll freely treat you as if you lived his life. All you got to do is put your faith in me. And I, and I was like, in that moment, I want to put my faith in you, Lord, but you, you need to change my heart. I need my heart to be changed. Cause if I don't, if you don't change my heart, I'm just going to run back to those same things. And he's like, quit your job at the bar. Really? That practical? Well, it was a lot of other things. I mean, I changed my phone number. I cut out all my friends. I had to do the radical things, the snipping in my life. Why? Because I would be back in that place if I didn't. That was being led by the Spirit. If I ignored that, I would have hardened my heart because the Holy Spirit spoke and I ignored. So the more you listen and follow and are led by the Spirit, the more frequent His voice becomes, the more obvious His voice becomes. Some, things, some other things that I've applied in my life is prayer. Obvious. It sounds so simple, but how is your prayer life? No man is greater than his prayer life. No woman is greater than her prayer life. A deep, consistent prayer life is key to hearing from the Holy Spirit. And guess what? Prayer is a two-way com- conversation. I speak to God, and I ask him to speak to me. And that's not weird or woo-woo to hear the Lord's voice. And again, I've never heard the audible voice of God, but I know when the Lord is speaking. He says, my sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. Another they will not follow. Having a deep, consistent prayer life is key. If you don't have a prayer life, you're not going to hear from the Lord. So pray. It takes intentional time. The other thing that, uh, that I've personally uh, applied to my life that has helped me to hear from the Spirit is journaling. Not everybody's a journaler. I recommend journaling. Why? Because for me, writing down my thoughts helps me make sense of my thoughts, and it helps me discern between my thoughts and God's thoughts, because sometimes I'll be feeling away. I don't even know what I'm feeling, but writing it down helps me process and work through what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. And instead of having all of the right answers all of the time, sometimes you just got to have the better questions, right? You got to be thinking about better questions. And my journal time is asking myself questions. What are you feeling? Why are you feeling that way? Whose voice are you listening to? What does the gospel say about that situation? And a lot of times you'll, you'll be surprised how much your flesh is talking and how much the Holy Spirit is talking. And so prayer, journaling, and retreat. Retreat is also uh, a thing that I've applied to, to my life. This is one of the benefits of Sabbath, by the way. Um, intentional rest, intentional slowing down, not doing anything. Why? To get alone with God. And so th- th- that was actually a command that I um, had been convicted of, of not obeying. Like, I want to follow the Lord in all of my life. And Memorial Day, you know, I took the day off. I was actually planning on working and then I ended up taking the actual day off. And I was, oh my gosh, like this is so incredible. My wife and I were just with the kids in the backyard, barbecuing, swimming, just hanging out as a family. And we started the day with a Bible study. We're like, why doesn't God just create like one day a week to where <laughs> I'm being dumb, but like I was, I, for the first time in a long time, I'm like, why have I not taken this commandment, not suggestion, commandment, serious? Because I think God needs me. Because I think that God needs me to, to work, to be able to do all that he's called me to do. I'm not that important. And God once a week reminds me that he does not need me. He wants me. He want, and he chooses to use me. He gives me the dignity of being useful. But one day a week, I intentionally do nothing. Think about the six days he worked. Then he creates man, gives them a command. And then on that seventh day, what does he do? Rest. He rests. We are created right before the rest of God. 
And he invites us into that rest. So retreat, that's one of the things, like slowing down. And so one of the things that I've done in, in my life, not everybody can do this, I get this, but if you can, in your own way, um, I, I break away I, for a few days just by myself, me and the Lord. And I lay my whole life on the altar before him, and I take inventory. Here's my relationships, here's my job, here's the ministry, all of the things, Lord. It's all yours anyway. Lord, speak to me. What do you want me to do? So retreat, break away from everything and everyone. Get your head above water. Spend some time with the Lord. All right, that's the first thing. Second thing is the word of God. So we're talking about the ways that we can partner with what God is doing in our sanctification. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be made more like Christ. So first, we have the Holy Spirit being spirit-led. Second, we have the word of God, John 17, 17. In our key text, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The word of God. There comes the question, how do I know if I'm hearing God's thoughts or my thoughts? If you be a person of the word, you'll know your thoughts versus God's thoughts. God's not going to tell you to do something at the expense of something else he's called you to do, period. I've heard all kinds of people, God told me to fill in the blank with something that's unbiblical and against what God has told them to do. And my response always is God's not going to tell you to do something that he's already told you to not do. Well, how do you know that? Be a person of his word. He's given you his word. You're not supposed to just figure it out. There's that movie, uh, Talladega Nights, where he's like, I think Jesus, you know, I like my Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says, like, I'm here to party, but I also want to come formal. Right? It's like you close your, nobody else has seen that yet because you're all Christians. I've never seen it. I've heard other people <laughs> tell me. I, I think it's hilarious when people like close their eyes and they just imagine what God is like. I'm like, you don't have to do that. Like he's given you his word to show you exactly what he is like. You don't have to figure this out. The word of God is your protection and sanctification. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Your word, not my feelings, not the bad pizza I had. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Psalm 119, 11, I have treasured your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Being sanctified, be, it means being made holy, being made pure. I don't want to sin. I want purity. I want holiness in my life. Well, he says, I've treasured your word in my heart so that I can do that, so that I don't sin against you. Psalm 119, 114, you are a shelter and my shield. What does a shelter do? It protects you. Shield protects you. I put my hope in your word. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth is, is going to pass away. But my words, Jesus says, will never pass away. And so th there should be a slide that talks about our people. Um, and, and so there, there's this sheet that I gave out to some of the people, some of the leaders in the worship team um, that says ecclesia-isms. Right? These are like sayings that I want to get into the people of this church. And one of the ecclesia-isms is our people. This is the type of disciple that I'm trying to be and multiply. I want to be this, and I want you to be this, and I'm trying to multiply this into the lives of our people. So who are we? Our disciples are gospel-fluent, biblically literate, Christ-centered, and mission-oriented. All four of these things assume that we are people of the word. Gospel-fluent, that means as we have fellowship and, uh, and community with one another, things come up. You get to, to see the lives of one another. Well, what do we do with that? We don't want to just give them Dr. Phil's counseling, right? We want to be able to speak the gospel to the everyday stuff of life. And so we want to be so filled with the gospel that we are fluent in the language of the gospel so we can speak it to the everyday stuff of all of our lives. And how do we do that? We have to be biblically literate. That means that we're going to look at the text and understand what it means. We're going to be people of the word. Christ-centered. All of the Bible is a big arrow pointing to the person and work of Christ. And mission-oriented. You're here for a reason. And that reason is found in the word of God. So all of this, our people, are, assumes that we are people of the word. We don't just talk about the word. We don't just reference the word. We don't just pull text out to validate what I already want to be true of the word. We don't sit above the word. No, we submit to it and we reverence the word. The word of God is above me. It's above this pulpit. The word of God is above you. This is not a pulpit, but you get it. We'll call this the pulpit. Um, we realize that the blood of the martyrs throughout the centuries has been spilled to preserve the word of God for us. Like think about the blood that was shed to be able to keep the word of God so that we can have it on our phones, on our iPads and in, in the book. Why? Because they believe so deeply that the words of Jesus' dying prayer, 
that we are sanctified by the truth and his word is truth. Jesus wants us to be sanctified. He wants us to be pure. How does he do that? Through his word. And so they were willing to lay down their lives so that we can have his word, that it would sanctify us. Romans 12, 2 says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. It's so easy. There's a pattern of the world, but we are set apart and, and, and sanctified from the world. Don't conform to it. That's the easy thing is just to conform. Throw up your hands. I'm done. I don't want to be hated anymore. I don't want to be called a bigot. I don't want to be called narrow-minded. I'm done fighting. I don't want to do anything. Just conform. He says, don't do that, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need the word of God to renew our mind. Why? Because Romans 10, 17, faith comes from what's heard, and what is heard comes through the message of God or the the word of Christ. So he's given us the means of of sanctification. The Holy Spirit, the word of God, the last one here is the unity of the church. Now, we're going to spend more time in this in a subsequent week because this is a big aspect of Jesus' prayer is the unity of the church. He says in in, uh, 1721, may they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. So again, we're going to be spending a lot more time on the unity of the church, uh, but suffice it to say that there is strength and protection in numbers. I get calls from people, hey, I'm not going to come to church tonight for this or that. And if it starts to become a pattern in your life, know that there is spiritual warfare. That if it's not something today, it's going to be something next week. If it's not something next week, it's going to be something the following week. I just don't get it. In my mind, I just committed. I'm going to be a person that of not just the word, but the church. The church. There is power in numbers. There is something about laying everything down in worship through praying for one another, to hearing the word of God, to submitting to the preaching of God's word, to taking communion together. All of these things are means of grace and sanctification in your life. And guess who doesn't want you to partake in this? The enemy. And Jesus says, protect them from the evil one. The church is a means of grace, the unity of the church. There's another slide that shows our uh, gathering. So not only do we have a type of people, which is gospel fluent, biblically literate, Christ-centered, mission-minded, but if those types of people are developed, they gather together, there's going to be a culture that is marked by diversity, a diverse gathering of people, madly in love with Jesus, deeply connected to each other, and radically devoted to the Great Commission. These are the marks of the culture that we're trying to create in Ecclesia. This is who we are. This is our gathering. Now, here's the thing. Diversity. Some people get all hung up on that word. You know, I got people that were like, oh, that, God hasn't called you to be diverse. He's called you to be faithful. I'm like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. When I look at Revelation, it says every tribe, every tongue, every nation. That sounds diverse. So if you don't like diversity here, you're not going to like it in heaven. But here, here's the thing. Diversity will sanctify you. Diversity will sanctify you. Why? Because it sounds all great. The, 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 by the way, in the world, the people who cry the loudest for diversity don't want you to be diverse. They want you to be just like them. It sounds great until you're around people who see things differently than you. Diversity will sanctify you. Yeah, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, right? And what happens when iron sharpens iron? Rough kinks are grinded out. Sparks fly. I always tell people it would be so much easier if everybody in my church just agreed with everything I said. But y'all don't. Y'all got opinions and you got understanding of the scripture that maybe I don't have. And guess what? That's good. That's good for you. And it's good for me. Why? Because iron sharpens iron. There's no growth. If everybody just was a parrot of me, it'd make me feel really great. Puff me up, but it wouldn't do you good. And wouldn't do me good. If everybody just agreed with everything, we all look just like Sean. When Jesus prayed to the father that we would be one, he's not asking that we would all be carbon copies of one another. He does want diversity in the body, and diversity will sanctify you. Now, so we are a diverse gathering of people, but the thing that unifies us, what, is our love for Jesus, madly in love with Jesus. Despite our differences, the love we have for Jesus is so strong that it empowers our unity amongst our differences. And what you need is a gospel-centered community that loves you dearly as an expression and overflow of our love for Christ. Now, when you're surrounded by that love, when you're surrounded by the people that are deeply in love with Jesus and as such are deeply in love with you, that sanctifies you. That's a part of your purification. I need that. And are deeply connected to each other. We can't do all of what God has called us to do if all we do is show up and leave. Show up late, leave early, don't stay for the fellowship meal. You're not in each other's homes. You're not in each other's lives. You're deeply connected to each other. Now, this is why we have all of those things that I listed 
We have our home groups. We have our men's groups. We have our women's groups. We have our monthly prayer. We have our fellowship meal every single week. Why? Not because I just like hanging out with people and I need more friends in my life. I'm not naturally like that. I'm like, I got stuff to do. I got other places to be. But God has said, no, no, you need to relax. You need to rest. You need to be with my people. Why? Because when I'm around you guys, the real Sean actually surfaces and you'll see my humanity and I will see yours. That's why not everybody here is like overly impressed with me. You might be overly impressed with me if all you do is show up and hear my amazing preaching, right? No. You can hear way better preaching if you want on your phone, if you needed to, from some of the best teachers in the world. And maybe some people who are out there in the internet world that might see the messages or they might be impressed with me. But the moment you start coming here and you start coming to the fellowship meals and you see my life and you see my house, not to say there's no sin going on, my life is an open book, but you become less impressed. Why? Because I'm just a human, just like you. And we need that. And when you're in community, deeply connected to each other, guess what? You can't hide from your sin. And that is good. God doesn't want you to hide from it. He wants to sanctify you through being open, being transparent. You need to plug in. People think it's, you know, coming to church is just to make you feel good. Well, a lot of times that's true. I feel great when I come. I love coming to, to the body of Christ. But what's also true is you get to see the humanity and they get to see yours. You get to see their sin and they get to see yours. And they, they get to speak the gospel to those things, to those areas in your life. And that is a sanctifying process in your life. Sanctification does not happen in the shadows. Sanctification does not happen in the shadows. It does not happen in isolation. And that last thing is radical devotion to the Great Commission. We, we, we serve together. Like this is part of the church, right? The, the church is not just the gathering of the saints, but we are the gathered and sent ones. We are sanctified and sent out. So we are, are sanctified from the world, sent into the world, and that's why we serve together. That's why throughout uh, the, the, the last year and a half, I've been introducing you to several different organizations that are serving this city. I've introduced you to Grace Family Love, to Breaking the Chains, to Bill Glass, to our work with the Fresno Mission, uh, ESA Love, Inc., the Care Portal. I'm going to continue to introduce you guys to what God is doing in the city. Why? Because we're better together. Not everybody can do everything, but every single one of you can do something in this city. And, the, and, and God has called us, the church, to be light in the world, to be salt and to be light. That's also part of your sanctification. And that's what the church has call, been called to do. You are sanctified from the world, sent into the world. And as you are sent, God continues to sanctify you. So closing thoughts. And, and I'm going to ask Taylor to come up here. He's going to lead us in a song of worship. And we're going to pray for one another. Um, but closing thoughts, just recapping this message. You are called to participate in your sanctification. Why? By surrendering. Or how? By surrendering to that sanctification. You're sanctified from the world, sent into the world. This is immediate. You are immediately, upon faith, sanctified, but you are also ongoingly sanctified. This is immediate and ongoing. God has given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you the Word of God. He's given you the gathering of the saints. All of these are ministries to sanctify you. These are all means to sanctify you. And so my exhortation as we leave here to get today is I want you to reflect on where you stand in your own personal sanctification journey. Ask this question. Remember, don't just have all the answers. Ask better questions. Am I actively participating with what God is doing in my life or am I fighting against it? Even fighting against it might be just ignoring the Holy Spirit. Are you actively participating? Are you being led by the Spirit? Are you listening to the voice of the Spirit of God and are you following that voice? Are you in the Word of God? Are you a person of the Word? Daily reading it without fail. Are you committed to the unity of the church? What is your commitment to the unity of the church looks like? Are you a consumer? Are you a contributor? Or are you a soldier? Are you consuming all of the benefits of the church? I love the hearing of the preaching. I love the worship. Or are you actually contributing to what God is doing here? Or are you a soldier for the kingdom of God? He's calling you to be a soldier, and that happens within the unity of the church. And so how deeply connected to the body are you? I, I want to challenge you. This is a very practical message because we can leave here and start applying these things a little bit more for one another. So the simple question I want you to ask each other as we pray for one another is, how can I pray for you? So I'm going to ask you to stand up. Everybody stand with me. Taylor is going to lead us in a song as we're praying for one another. I'm not going to have anybody come to the front uh, this week. Last week we did that. Next week might be something different. But I want us to pray for one another. So that means someone might be next to you. You could just put your hand on their shoulder and ask that simple question. 
how can I pray for you? That's it. And I want you to be real in your answers.